first of all, thank you for coming by. It's great to have a conversation on Angelopoulos. Uh, to be honest, I don't usually have the chance to talk about Angelopoulos with too many people. A lot of people that I know of haven't really heard about uh, Theo Angelopoulos. And I came across you whilst I was researching on Angelopoulos. I, I saw that you had published a book on the Edinburgh University Press, a book about Angelopoulos with lots of essays. And I thought the book was really good. It, it had lots of interesting insight in there. And I thought it would be an interesting person to talk about him. Um, so I decided to, to invite you for this conversation between two people that enjoy filmmaking and enjoy uh, the Greek director. Angelos Kotsourakis is, is, a, is a professor at uh, Leeds University, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he has studied at the University of Athens, the University College in Dublin, University of Sussex and the University of Copenhagen. Um, he has a degree on theatre studies, modern drama and performance studies, and a PhD focused on film, as well as being an author of several books published by Bloomsbury and the Edinburgh University Press. Did I get that correctly? Uh, yeah, the only through. thing is that I'm not a full professor as yet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm right, an associate right. professor. But thanks for <laughs> putting an argument for my promotion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully it'll work that way, yeah. <laughs> so... First question would be, what got you into cinema? Because from what I can understand, you started your studies on theater. And then at some point, uh, you decided to focus on filmmaking. And so what, what made you change the subject? What got you that interested in filmmaking that made you want to follow the studies concerned with that? I mean, to, to begin with, uh, I studied, uh, not, uh, you know, I'm not interested in filmmaking because I don't make films. I mean, I would be interested, but like many academics, I'm one of those, you know, uh, sort of like uh, failed artists <laughs> who would have liked to be something that they are not. So they talk about it. So I'm into film studies, film theory, yeah. you know, the academic analysis of film rather than filmmaking. Uh, my first degree was also yeah in theater studies which uh, is uh, very similar to my current uh, sort of like um, uh, work in the sense that um, it was like about the academic study of theater rather than um, you know the practical uh, study of it or the practical uh, or, or, or practical theater making you know mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what got me is that i, I do think that in, in continental europe um, disciplines are not so much set in stone as in the Anglophone world. So if you're interested in literature, you are simultaneously interested in theater and cinema and the other way around. Like if you're interested in cinema, you have to have a bit of a background in literature and theater. So we did the, uh, my degree had uh, many, many cinema classes. And uh, I knew that in the future at some point, I would uh, like to do something uh, uh, more uh, film specific uh, and, uh, you know, leave uh, the, the academic study of theatre. But at the same time, even having left the academic study of theatre, like I, I keep on following uh, research and my, I try to have an interdisciplinary research of theatre, cinema and literature and history and critical theory intersect. And I, I'm really not very keen on this kind of disciplinarization that uh, is very big characteristic and part of the Anglophone in the American university. The, the American in, in the very good universities, not so much. They try to, you might see professors writing a book on literature and then a book on cinema or something. Uh, whereas in the, it, it's a UK thing, I would say more like very disciplinarization, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I feel like there's sort of intersectionality between all those arts and you have theater plays and films that um, share many, many aspects and the way that they try to bring something to the audience. It's all very, very close, uh, very connected. And to me, it's perfectly natural to view things uh, the way, as you described it, as having this underlying connection and not having these separate categories. There's something that binds them, that connects them on an artistic level. Um, I was wondering... What does cinema represent for you? What What's the meaning of cinema for you? I mean, uh, as far as I'm concerned, cinema is about utopia. And um, I mean, this is why our current age is not very cinematic. We have everything like, you know, with the internet and the, 
you know, mobile phones, uh, everything is accessible, but um, I, I do not know how good is that for imagination? I mean, like for, for some of us who are older, like um, cinema was, and here I, I kind of think a bit of Susan Sontag's uh, lament for the loss of cinephilia was not just a means of entertainment, was it a way of learning about the world, learning about histories of other nations, learning Absolutely. about global oppression, learning about learning how to flirt, how to, I mean, how to imagine things, to, to be dreamers in a way also, which is not uh, a bad thing at all. Like I'm not saying that in the typical anti-Hollywood uh, uh, way. So yeah, cinema was an institution that went far, far beyond the confines of the of the dark theater, and uh, it was a, a, a way of uh, sort of uh, let's say of getting outside of the parochialism of your own country as well, of learning things that uh, you wouldn't be able to do. Uh, because, you know, it is important to remember that uh, uh, international travel became very cheap and accessible towards the late 90s, beginning of the 2000s. But before that, uh, there were many people uh, in many countries, like uh, from the periphery, but also the center, where they couldn't travel as much. Yeah. And uh, intercultural communication, cinema is a big part of that, was a great way of... Uh, uh, getting to know something about places outside of your own um, uh, country. And I, I think Alain Badier mentions that in his writings of cinema, about how cinema allows us to learn about uh, other places. He, he says in particular, what would we know about Iran? Wasn't it for Kerostami? Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. You know, and, and it's very important, very important point, like, you know, because uh, if we relied simply on the dominant media, <laughs> And on the mainstream media, uh, we think of Iran as this horrible place and totally inhumane. Mm -hmm. But I mean, films by Kerostami and other people who are in the black books of the Iranian government painted a totally different image where there is uh, some humanity in the country as well and something uh, extremely interesting and, and um, uh, beautiful uh, to sort of like to learn more about that place. So yeah, that's what cinema means. And sorry if I went off on a tangent, but yeah. <laughs> No, no, that was an amazingly comprehensive answer, and I thank you for that. Uh, I gotta say, I absolutely agree with you. And for example, I often make try to make this point come across uh, when I talk about cinema with uh, acquaintances, with friends, or even when I write the video essays for the channel. That you know, cinema can be very entertaining, can be a good way of spending time. Uh, but at the same time, cinema can also be something else much greater. It can be a, a reflexive moment for us to consider other perspectives of learning about other cultures, of uh, learning history, like you said. You know, cinema can be something very great, very important for humanity. So it's important to, for me at least, it's important to just not just consume um, entertainment films, which I do as well, and it's completely fine. But at the same time, you know, I feel like there's something even greater than that to be obtained from cinema when you watch films by Angelopoulos, by Kiarostami, like you said, by Mizoguchi or Dreyer, Antonioni, you name it. There's plenty of uh, great film artists. And so I agree with you on that uh, completely. And it's an interesting point that you made as well, is that once you get to see these sorts of films that we've mentioned, you know, like you said, in Iran may come across as a very bleak and grey country from the media. But when you watch Kiarostami or Panahi's films, you can see that there's people in there just like you and me. People like just ordinary people that are trying to live their lives, that have the same anxieties, the same emotions. There's this sort of universality that comes across these films and makes them so powerful. At least for me, that's when I get that sense, when I get that, I, I get slightly emotional sometimes, you know, I'm not typically a kind of person to get emotional. I'm very rational minded or I, I try to, but sometimes when I watch a film, you know, I can say that I have watched Kiarostami films that made me 
well, not to cry, but at least my eyes got kind of moist. So let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, okay. there's moments yeah. in there that are so beautiful and so amazing. He makes us really empathetic with the characters that he describes and the real people that often appear in his films. You know, his films are not strictly uh, fictional films. They often blend this reality and the documentary and the like fiction that, yeah. aspects. So, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, concerning Angelopoulos, you know, I wanted to ask you, how did you come across? Well, obviously, you're 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 uh, you have Greek nationality. You were born and lived in Greece for a long time. So I'm guessing uh, you must have come across him earlier than most people. But I was wondering, you know, what what were your impressions when you first saw a film by him by Angelopoulos? I'm guessing you must have watched a film in Greece. Uh, what did you think of it? What were your impressions on that first time viewing an Angelopoulos film? Uh, just to say something before I answer to the second part of the question, uh, it's important to clarify, and this is something we say also in the book, that um, uh, the fact that you're a Greek doesn't mean that you might end up watching Angelopoulos ever, because for many years, uh, Angelopoulos was one of those filmmakers uh, who were more popular abroad rather than in their own country. And this applies to Fassbinder, for instance, who was like uh, uh, extremely abroad, uh, popular abroad, whereas in Germany, not so much. And many other modernist filmmakers uh, that we describe, or many, many filmmakers from the Cinema Nouveau or from the third cinema movement, they got an international following, but uh, in their own countries, they were uh, looked down on uh, as non-mainstream or as too esoteric. And th th there were lots of jokes about Angelopoulos as I was growing up in Greece. And, uh, but um, as we say in the book, uh, the thing about Angelopoulos was that he didn't use the, the formal, the, the, the language of the, of the Greek cinema, let's say, of the mainstream Greek cinema, but he relied on the, the language of modernism, which was much more international and it uh, crossed the, uh, uh, the, the international borders. So, you know, to understand Angelopoulos, you need to know Mr. Gucci, you need to know Jancho, Miklos Jancho from Hungary, you need to know obviously Antonioni. So, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, many of these uh, filmmakers uh, were not necessarily um, known at the time uh, because uh, uh, they, you know, there were not so many film festivals as now in the 50s or 60s or 70s to, to make people aware. Of course, Antonioni, yeah, many films by Antonioni came to Greece belatedly, like in the 70s or late 60s and stuff, but uh, there was not such a circulation uh, as now. So, so well, modernism was something that um, um, in many countries in the periphery uh, manifested itself differently or uh, th there is not one temporality of modernism. So it, it, uh, in some countries from the core, uh, which are more developed, uh, modernism also obviously manifests itself earlier, whereas uh, there is a different temporality for countries from the periphery. Uh, so yeah, like Angelopoulos was uh, not very, uh, I mean, some of his first films, were uh, broke the record so in terms of tickets and stuff, even in Greece, like the traveling players, but pre pre predominantly because of the subject matter, because it was the first film ever to deal with uh, the uh, post-war Greek history uh, from, not post-war, actually 20th century, you could say, uh, from the left-wing point of view. Uh, it was the first film to say that, and people felt the need to, to sort of like participate in this uh, rewriting of history, let's say. Uh, but eventually, uh, this type of cinema, this type of epic, formalist, anti-heroic cinema uh, couldn't necessarily speak to the majority of uh, cinema goers in Greece. So uh, Angelopoulos became on the receiving end of many jokes and stuff. Uh, I saw some of the films uh, when they played in Greek television and then in cinema, in cinemas in Greece, but also when there were retrospectives. But also at the university, when um, the student unions organized the uh, screenings. I mean, the first film that I saw by Angelopoulos, and uh, I saw it properly, I mean, that, uh, you know, I was focused and uh, I was at an age that I could, was the suspended step of the stork, and then uh, Landscape in the Mist and uh, the Ulysses Gaze. Uh, and uh, I had seen earlier uh, uh, 
uh, the traveling play. So the very, very first was a traveling place, but I wasn't mature enough to understand it. But however, what I remember from this is how certain sequences stayed with me forever uh, as I was growing up. And uh, this is something that I find uh, fascinating. Like for instance, I remember one sequence where two people are pictured uh, walking in a big tracking shot on a railway station. And uh, they talk, they, they have a speech about the international socialism and like the capitalist contradictions, etc. It has something essayistic, this, this part of the film. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly they start singing Carmela, the song from the Spanish Civil War. I remember that this, kind of sequence stayed with me for many, many years. I was probably 14 years old and I saw it properly when I was like 21 again or 20. And uh, I remember that sequence as a kind of a cinematic uh, fetishized uh, visual <laughs> that I never forgot. And uh, I think that's what Angelopoulos is about uh, in, in a way. He is uh, like many other modernists. It's not just about the whole, the film as a whole. It's about all these moments. Uh, like the, the last concluding visual in the suspended step of the stork, where uh, uh, the camera registers the grey landscape contradicted by the repairmen with the yellow jackets. A beautiful uh, image, isn't it? So yeah, it is also about the, the, this kind of image that have something, you know, amazingly utopian, uh, because they, you know, and this is something we also said in the book, they communicate this belief in cinema. So, I mean, uh, Angelopoulos was not a modernist who criticized the image. So he wasn't like Godard, although Godard was very much influential on him and he acknowledged it many times. He wasn't like Godard who tried to criticize the image. He tried to, to sort of like, um, uh, to communicate something through the, the formal surplus, but also the, the beauty of the image. And uh, this was, very much interconnected with his belief in cinema's capacity. It was very utopian, he acknowledged that cinema could actually change the way we perceive the world. And uh, he, so he, he wasn't like the mo those modernists or postmodernists later who, who, whose politics relied on the critique of the image. Uh, it was the other way around. <laughs> Thanks for that comprehensive answer once again. I think it gives a great context to how Angelopoulos uh, is perceived or has been perceived in Greece for some time. My following question would be actually about that, but since you mentioned, you know, the jokes about Angelopoulos in Greece, I've interacted with Greek people before in different settings, and I remember distinctly this answer that one Greek uh, girl told me when I asked her if she had seen any Angelopoulos films if she enjoyed it because at the time I had seen two or three by him and I was completely uh, blown away by, by the films and I wanted to talk about this with other people and I wanted to ask them what they think of it and she told me you know back in Greece we're kind of tired of Angelopoulos films uh, we don't deal with that anymore we don't have the patience for that anymore and you know that made me a bit sad to be honest i was hoping for a different answer but at the same time made me think why why are these amazing films not being seen as something special and why are uh, the the greek people not uh, willing to engage with these films with the same level of excitement that i am at the moment so that was kind of interesting but uh you know, about the, those aspects that he mentioned of Angelopoulos that make his film so so distinctive. Uh, I was wondering, are those aspects that he mentioned the ones that resonate with you the most? In other words, um, when it comes to the films of Angelopoulos, are those the things that he think are more valuable about his films? Or are there other things that he does in his films that you think that are really important at, and that are worth mentioning as well? Yeah, I mean, just to, to say something a bit about uh, what you said uh, about Greece and like, you know, how people are not familiar. Like, you, you might encounter something similar if you talk to Chinese people and uh, tell them about your excitement about sixth generation Chinese cinema. It's not popular at all. Most of many Chinese people, or, or, you know, the, the majority of the cinema goers would think that um, you are somehow crazy to love these films because they are so depressing. They would say, <laughs> but it's like, you know, here, um, this is what we love from Chinese cinema. Many of us are into it, like, you know, this kind of sixth generation of this art cinema from the fifth generation onwards, from Chen Kai Ge to Jia Zhang, 
the known of these people um, who are very familiar, very popular abroad. And they managed to get many of them funding from abroad rather than from China itself, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. which speaks volumes given that China is such a, a global economy superpower. Uh, but uh, uh, Angelopoulos is films, yeah, like, you know, obviously it's not, uh, I wouldn't recommend to somebody to see them just for the visual beauty. Obviously, I'm interested in uh, the politics of representation a lot, and I would suggest it. Um, I do think that the first uh, four films are uh, the paragons of a great uh, uh, way of uh, dealing with history cinematically and dealing with history epically also in a Brechtian but Piscatorian also way where we have choruses and we have uh, balongs as Piscator says, which is like, you know, the movements of the bodies to produce certain social attitudes and um, gestures. They communicate a, a feeling of a historical period. And uh, also, you know, history is presented from below. Uh, you know, we don't have uh, people, major figures in Angelopoulos' cinema, like, uh, I don't know, uh, like Napoleon or people like that. You know, history is written from below. Even the the, the, the film Mega Alexandros, it uh, translates to Alexander the Great. It's not about Alexander the Great. It's about an imaginary commune and how it turns into a dictatorship and stuff. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, they, they are uh, great examples of an epic cinema, uh, a, a cinema where the emphasis is uh, on collectives, on social processes, on uh, um, sort of uh, a, a dialectical Marxist view of history and uh, an undramatic, I would say, anti-heroic uh, type of cinema. So they're fascinating examples, these four films. And obviously, um, uh, there is a shift in his career afterwards. So I'm sure that you have read a bit about this, like the films after the historical tetralogy, after Mega Alexandros, they become more lyrical, more focused on the individual rather than on collectives, but they still have a kind of a, some of them at least, dialectical subtlety. Uh, films like Voyage to Kithira or uh, Ulysses Gaze and uh, certainly the suspended step of the stork. Um, they deal with issues that they are very relevant and they sort of like uh, emphasize the persistence of history at the time that um, there was the, the, the general consensus was that we have reached the end of history. Uh, so you might think of uh, how he, he kind of anticipates a refugee crisis in Europe in the suspended step of the stork. And uh, which by the time that this film was made, um, th th there was a small refugee kind of um, crisis, but uh, nowhere near the reality we experience in the present, nowhere near uh, what is happening now, where we see that um, global uh, capitalism creates wealth for the core, but also lots of poverty for the peripheries, the global peripheries, and this can have eventually a, a dialectical counter effect. So Angelopoulos, yeah, dealt with these things and uh, he, he dealt also with questions of memory that they are very significant, thinking about what was the 20th century, like, you know, how it started and what did it produce. Uh, if there is something like a hope that we can uh, aspire to, but he also dealt um, in Ulysses' case and very efficiently, I think, with uh, the, the matter of um, uh, uh, sort of uh, the persistence of history, uh, because following the uh, the collapse of the, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the idea that history has come to an end was a uh, very fast uh, challenge, very quickly challenged by the civil wars in Balkans, for example. Uh, that, um, you know, and ironically, for a kind of a system like, you know, kind of ne neoliberal capitalism, which sees all about globalism, internationalism, and all that stuff, it was very ironic to see how. Uh, the first thing that happened after 1989 was the sort of uh, disintegration of larger countries into smaller ones, such as Yugoslavia or like the former Soviet Union into smaller parts. So we had like, you know, the, the return of the nation state in a way and the return of uh, wars about borders and things like that. So I, I do think that, Angel that uh, yeah, like in these films, like Ulysses Gaze uh, uh, beautifully captures this kind of uh, uh, irony where um, 
yeah, uh, the, the sort of uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah, there is a beautiful image of Lenin, uh, sort of like uh, flowing in the river in Danium, um, has uh, sort of like, uh, hasn't necessarily produced a different type of narrative that can be, let's say, unifying rather than disintegrating. So it is quite ironic because these places where dictatorships, most of them, nobody disagrees that you're not proper communist uh, democracy, so uh, and nothing to do with the spirit of Marxism. But at the same time, uh, what followed was also interesting to think about how uh, there was a different type of cynicism that uh, people were asked to accept oligarchy, were asked to accept uh, corruption, were asked to, uh, to participate in this beautiful uh, reality of consumerism, which obviously they couldn't because of the, the, uh, the division of the world into centers and peripheries. And uh, yeah, these are things that Angelopoulos' film touched, uh, even the more uh, sort of like the later period. They sort of um, have a persistent fascination with history and its marks, its, tra its traumas, its wounds of individuals uh, who try to make sense of it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. That's one of the most fascinating things about Angelopoulos is how varied is his discourse throughout his films in terms of themes and subjects. It's so expansive, uh, so large and encompassing. I, I haven't seen too many filmmakers with that sort of broad discourse present in those works. And definitely that's one of the characteristics that better defines Angelopoulos' films. And it's so interesting because he, like you said, he was uh, a left-leaning filmmaker working in a time that wasn't particularly pleasant perhaps for, for left-leaning people in Greece, I'm assuming. Uh, the fact that he managed to work and do those films and present those questions, it requires a sort of bravery uh, and a sort of very focused vision and intent. And uh, that's definitely one of the other things that makes uh, Angelopoulos so interesting. Um, still concerning his uh, his uh, reception and understanding in Greece, you know, later on, I, I kind of understood that because we have a similar case here in Portugal too. I don't know if you heard about filmmakers Manuel de Oliveira and of Pedro course. Costa. Yeah, and, you, you know, we have those kinds of jokes as well uh, about them. Uh, people have those kinds of jokes, like uh, their films are too slow, nobody watches them, they only earn awards uh, outside the country and all that. And yeah, so it yeah. got me, you know, once I learned of that, I kind of understood the perception that uh, Angelopoulos has in, in Greece as well. And Angelo what about the other filmmaker um, uh, who did this Arabian Nights, a big film? Yeah, Miguel uh, Gomes. Miguel, Miguel Gomes. Gomes. He, he, yeah, he Miguel, I would say Miguel Gomes is perhaps on the same level of understanding by the by the public, the Portuguese public. Although mm -hmm. he, I think he is somewhat more accessible than Manuel de Oliveira and Pedro Costa uh, in terms yeah, of yeah. pacing and in terms of uh, language. It's similar in some aspects, but it's slightly more accessible. But definitely, that's a good example as well. Uh, there's not too many people. I, that I know at least that I've seen films by those people. And yet again, I find them so, so incredible, so, so great and so important. Uh, <laughs> so you mentioned lots of themes about the films that are present in Angelopoulos. I wanted to ask you about a, some specific ones with, which I think are, are more conspicuous. And I feel like in, in his films, there's this question that comes across every once in a while, which is what it means to be a Greek person. What does it mean to have a Greek nationality? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that question is framed in his work, in his films? I mean, yeah, I, I think that, you know, as somebody who sort of like, whose work drew so much on international movements, such as Antonioni, as I said before, Miso Gucci, Angelo studied in France, and he worked in the cinemas in there, and he was one of the rats of the cinema tech. He worked, he sold tickets at some point. And so, I mean, his, his culture was so much, his cinematic culture, let's say it more, was very much um, uh, influenced by 
sin embargo, es el global cultural institution. So as I said, he was the Japanese film. He was a fan of film noirs, Billy Wilder, of uh, uh, <coughs> musicals like the Minelli musicals and uh, and classical Hollywood, but also yeah, silent cinema, and Eisenstein, and uh, all these filmmakers. So uh, his uh, education and his uh, sort of like style as a filmmaker uh, didn't have much to do with uh, the Greek culture of cinema. Almost nothing at all, and that's one of the reasons for you know the, the people's discomfort with him in his homeland, and, and probably why he became much more popular abroad, like in certain countries at least, you know, um, precisely because of his internationalist style, uh, modernist. Uh, now, I, I mean, obviously, Angelopoulos, uh, when it comes to Greek, the Greek uh, in, in Angelopoulos cinema, there are certain myths that they are reworked. But uh, as you can imagine, for, for many years, the Greek right uh, drew on tradition as a, a, a mechanism of speaking about some kind of form of nationalistic greatness, and so, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, as in every country, obviously, like in the UK, it's the empire and stuff, uh, and uh, exactly. the past as a form of nationalistic greatness. So what, what Angelopoulos did was, um, and this is like a very modernist kind of re-engagement, was he tried to Uh, he said that many times to use, uh, let's say, um, uh, Greek mythology or uh, myths, uh, not to celebrate uh, uh, the dead stones or the dead past, but to think about the present of the time and the history. So, for instance, uh, this is something that many, many, many modernists did throughout the 20th century, like from Sartre to uh, Zirato. Uh, Heiner Muller later, Roberto Brecht, obviously, and uh, uh, James Joyce with the Ulysses. And uh, so modernist has like a kind of a, uh, had this um, tendency to rework myths from the past and think something about uh, uh, the present of the time and the, the modern times. So this is what how Greece matters a lot to Angelopoulos in the sense that he uses certain uh, myths from the past, like we have the Orestia uh, uh, in uh, Eschylus Orestia that is uh, sort of like uh, referred to in uh, Angelop in the traveling players. And uh, there is a myth of Ulysses, uh, which is very important in uh, the Boyas to Kifira, but also uh, Ulysses' gaze. And uh, there, but um, obviously, uh, what, a very important thing uh, about Greece is Greek history uh, in uh, the 20th century. And Greece as an underdeveloped nation um, in the periphery of Europe and the world, you could think about, whose history is always at the mercy of foreign powers. And, uh, and uh, obviously, the, uh, the history of uh, the resistance which was uh, for many years uh, forbidden to be told, like, as I said, the history from the left, uh, because the resistance against the Nazis was uh, grassroots, and it started, like in Yugoslavia, from communists, and it was a big, big communist movement, which was eventually suppressed by the, uh, uh, during the Greek Civil War, where we had the first napalm bombs being thrown by uh, the American army before Vietnam now. And... Uh, There's actually a documentary, a BBC documentary, which is available on YouTube, that was banned. Uh, it was only shown once, and it was banned by Thatcher, called The Greek Civil War, The, the, the Hidden War. And it is all about that. And uh, you, you might even see some British soldiers saying that how uh, the people that were fighting together against the Nazis, they were the ones that they had to shoot afterwards. Like, and the traveling oh. players in the civil war, I mean, and the traveling players deals a lot with it. So yeah, like this kind of aspect of um, uh, a peripheral country imagining something and this uh, sort of like uh, failing to materialize is something that uh, preoccupies until the very end, I think, of uh, his career, where um, the, he constantly returned to the trauma of the civil war and what it meant. And, and I mean, like, obviously, during the 90s, even uh, people like us could, uh, the early 2000s, uh, laugh at this kind of uh, obsession with it. But eventually, if you see the, what happened after the economic crisis in Greece, with the uh, sort of like uh, the growing of the Golden Dawn, a very uh, Nazi, a Nazi 
partly a mandatory party and the nostalgia about um, uh, sort of like uh, the extreme right, but also a, a desire to think of left ways of dealing with the crisis created a division in the country that is rooted in uh, this particular time, civil war, and it has been um, uh, not overcome as yet because we didn't have the carnation revolution like in Portugal where things um, kind of changed in a more smooth way uh, in Greece, like uh, what happened is that there was a, a, an intervention always from big powers like America and Britain in the Civil War. And then there was the, the junta of the colonels in the 1967, which was funded by NATO and um, supported by the United States of America. Uh, so uh, things did not change as smoothly, I would say, as in Portugal, for instance. Uh, I don't think that in Spain they changed smoothly, but <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it's just that Franco died, but the yeah. many structures of Franco is stayed afterwards. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in, in Greece, uh, the, the, the civil war for many people was a trauma that was persistent. And I think that modern history kind of justifies this approach that, yeah, it, it, it isn't something just, that you just forget. Yeah, definitely. I think it's one of the recurring themes in his films too. It's the, the effects of the, the civil war in Greece and the violence <laughs> and the the trouble that the country has suffered uh, throughout many years, many decades uh, because of that. And perhaps there are scars that are still alive today, nowadays, because Absolutely. of the of the civil war. You know, I had this feeling that Angelopoulos, the way that he frames the, the question of what it means to be Greek, for example, he uses themes of Greek history, of uh, Greek myths, uh, Greek poetry or philosophy, but another filmmaker would perhaps try to use it to exalt the nationhood and the patriotic yeah. feeling of Greece. And Angelopoulos does none of that. He, in fact, uses them in order to say something about the world, not just Greece. He, he manages to use his own history and culture and and meets in order to develop a discourse that has something to say for other countries beside Greece. And that's one of the things that appeals to me as well. He uses, for example, the theme of traveling, which is probably derived or inspired mostly because of the Odyssey of Ulysses, like you mentioned. And uh, this is very recurrent, the, the theme of traveling. You have people that are running from wars, escaping from conflicts. They are going across different countries. They're going through Macedonia, through Greece, through Germany. And you have these people that uh, are trying to, at the end of the day, they're traveling. And it's not just the destination that matters or their nationality. It's the act of traveling itself and how it transforms them. And it doesn't matter if they are from from the United States or from China or from Africa. Uh, in, in specific, in Angelopoulos films, you have people that are mostly from the Balkans. And you have this sort of empathetic feeling and understanding of how people are actually living and surviving. Uh, and it's a very, very hopeful, very inspiring outlook that he has on his films. Uh, would you agree with that, with that perspective on, on, on traveling on his films? I mean, yeah, like traveling is uh, used in different ways, obviously, in each of the films. Like, you know, in tra the traveling players are, a, for instance, are just a group that travels throughout Greece to make a living. Like, you know, these uh, theater troops of the past. Um, uh, Ulysses Gaze is all about re rediscovering the first uh, look of the cinema, the innocent look. And, uh, and yeah, traveling is important there, like in, in the sense of the era of the transnational borders, uh, the main uh, character is Greek American. Uh, so he's an exile who uh, tries to find uh, uh, meaning through cinema only to discover that the meaning is in reality, kind of uh, the civil war there in the Balkans. In uh, the suspended step of the stork, traveling is uh, not necessarily, uh, it is, uh, let's say, more uh, flows of migration. Uh, rather than traveling for, uh, to find meaning or leisure and stuff. It's about moving uh, uh, somewhere else for, for, to, to find security that is not possible in your homeland. So, yeah, there is certainly like the, um, this kind of uh, 
reference to Ulysses. But again, uh, as we said, like uh, it lacks this Eurocentric idea of, uh, you know, I don't know if you know Horkheimer and Adorno's idea of Ulysses as one of the first uh, examples of the Enlightenment subjectivity of the individual who can do a Eurocentric approach to history, the individual who can do uh, everything he, because it's a male, you know, uh, everything he wants and uh, sort of like uh, to do that he exploits others as Ulysses does so you know in, in Angelopoulos' films yeah we don't have that we have the the kind of uh, the nostalgia for a place uh, we have the, uh, the, the the desire for exploration but again disconnected from this let's say proto-colonial and uh, sort of like proto-capitalist uh, early capitalist sort of like an idea of Ulysses as uh, uh, the kind of shrewd individual who manages to to achieve his aims no matter what the hardness and the... So yeah, there is a remaking, a kind of a, re, a reworking of the myth again, I would say. Yeah, concerning the myth, it has got me thinking right now. I was, I was just thinking that there are moments as well in his films that have this sort of magical atmosphere to it. There's something slightly surreal, slightly oneric to it. And um, I was I was wondering, um, are these related and connected with the power of the myths of, of transforming reality? Uh, what would you have to say about those those moments that you find sometimes in his films that defy reasoning or expectation? I mean, some of them are just placing different historical periods within a frame. So it's not that they defy reasoning per se, it's just that they try to show the interconnection between the past and the present. And this is a standard device in modern cinema. He's not the first one to do that. Like obviously uh, other filmmakers have done it. Janssen has done this and uh, uh, I guess- uh, Tarkovsky uh, as well, perhaps. Tarkovsky, yes. And uh, filmmakers from uh, uh, the Czechoslovak, the Polish New Wave and uh, so yeah, it's a standard uh, trope. Even Bertolucci, I think, in some films, uh, his early works. And so, uh, but the, many of the others could be seen as a as a note to cinema, as creating like images that well, what I said before that they are uh, uh, <clears throat> that they have something utopian into them. And uh, like yeah, the last scene in the <clears throat> suspended step of the stork, or perhaps. Uh, uh, the last scene in the Voyage to Kithira, where uh, the man is on this kind of makeshift uh, boat, yeah. uh, borderless, uh, which is uh, beautiful, but also very kind of politically uh, loaded uh, sequence. Uh, so yeah, there, there is a there, there is a kind of in, in these sequences you could think you could say yeah that there is this belief in cinema's capacity to transform our gaze of reality, not to transform reality, but to transform our perception. Our perception, certainly. yes. But just uh, on, on what you said about Greece before and what it means, I mean, Angelopoulos should be seen as the cinema nouveau or the third cinema filmmakers in terms of his relationship to his country. In the sense, uh, in one interview in the 60s, when, when he made a small film, the broadcast before his first feature, he was saying to one of the important figures of the Greek intelligence, cinematic intelligentsia there, that we need to do something like the cinema of war. And um, if you remember in these countries, like in cinema of war and third cinema, uh, on the one hand, uh, there was a kind of a, an important national element there in the sense that uh, the national element was a critique of imperialism. But at the same time, a big critique of the sort of like home uh, nationalism, which was mostly linked with the upper classes and uh, nationalism in uh, sort of like these countries like Brazil and Argentina, when we talk about cinema, um, was the, something uh, mainly uh, connected with uh, the upper classes who, who, and was used as a means of distracting people from uh, forms of social inequality or uh, uh, sort of like uh, the modern history and uh, its traumas, its persistent traumas on the present of the time. So similarly with Angelopoulos, uh, there is a strong 
aspect of Greece in his films, but this is uh, not a nationalist Greece. It's not one that um, sort of like, uh, let's say, uh, uh, makes a, a, provides an ideal image of his homeland. Uh, nowhere near that. It is one that wants to think um, to, that uses national history and uses the specificity of Greece uh, to think against um, imperialism, at least in the first tetralogy of uh, films. So it's an anti-imperial gaze. Uh, and in some of the others, I would say, uh, the more. Uh, so yeah, to understand the, the, the role of the nation, uh, it is important to compare him with these filmmakers, with um, the cinema of war and the third cinema ones, because it's exactly uh, what he was saying that we, that Greek filmmakers need to do, who are politically, obviously, who are uh, political. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it, it kind of uh, very visibly uh, criticizes his, his, uh, his films are at the opposing end of uh, those um, kind of Greek-American productions of the 70s during the junta and afterwards where uh, presented this kind of Zorba-style image of Greece as an idyllic place, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. This depoliticized, you know. Yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, for sure. That's one of the things that, that I was thinking as well. Uh, obviously, most people know Greece perhaps because of its beauty, geographical beauty, uh, mm. because of its culture. And they know Greece from the documentaries, the postcards, the photography and whatnot. And Angelopoulos doesn't want to have to do anything with it. He, you know, he doesn't no. present Greece as this paradise, this touristic place, this picture perfect kind of country where people would go and it's, they're going to have a beautiful vacation or whatever. He presents a Greece that it's much rawer, much much more realistic perhaps in a sense it's it's a Greece that it's much more complex and much richer i would say as well i wanted to ask you if you could develop a, a bit on that as well on the on the way that he presents uh, Greece as this uh, place that is so antithetical to to the Greece that most people know of uh, the Greece of the beaches and the blue roofed uh, houses and uh, the large weddings and all of that, because Angelopoulos, he makes a very different depiction of, of Greece in his films that are very alluring at the same time. You know, the pictures aren't necessarily beautiful in the classic aesthetic sense, but at the same time, the scenes that he creates from a cinematographic standpoint, they are very well composed. They are very well thought out. The blocking is incredible. Uh, the pacing is also very, very well thought out. Can you develop a little bit about this, the way that he depicts Greece as this very distant image from what people are used to, to seeing the country? I mean, there is one scene in Days of 36 uh, where he has a, he plays a little bit with a cliche image of Greece, where some uh, British uh, locals who have property and uh, they are uh, sort of like uh, uh, have an influence on the uh, internal politics of the country are presented uh, walking uh, sort of like idly across the beach and um, obviously this visual there uh, communicates um, sort of like a sense of the persistent imperialism and Greece is sort of like a, and not I would say because I do believe that Greece is an example for broader international politics in his work like you know peripheral countries sort of like subjugation to kind of imperialist politics. And it is persistent, but it is ironic and it obviously uh, communicates a certain uh, idea about foreign intervention in uh, the country's politics and uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the country was uh, uh, not independent, as we are told, in the same way that countries like Poland was not independent after the Second World War, or, I don't know, uh, uh, other countries that belong to the, the, the Soviet bloc, Czechoslovakia, similarly, like, you know, Greece was a, a country that followed uh, dictates from the top, from Britain and America. And he does this so beautifully and naturally by showing this, um, by just showing a, a group of people idly talking and obviously treating the country as a beautiful place with this kind of funny indigenous creatures <laughs> who are... Uh, uh, 
uh, sort of like totally different from what they know. Uh, but overall, uh, yes, his films uh, are shot in the north of Greece, where he preferred to shoot, which uh, north of Greece has a different climate, obviously from uh, uh, the islands or the south of Greece, uh, that um, um, this touristic image circulates amongst the media and people's minds. And the, no the north of Greece has a more like, you could say, European continental climate, uh, where the the there are some places like in Florida where he suits that there is six months of snow and they're in the borders with the Balkans. And, and yeah, he liked that because uh, there was uh, uh, obviously these uh, places he was sitting on location um, not only um, reveal a different image of the country that uh, not many are familiar with, but uh, I, I would say also uh, had something more to do with the art cinematic aesthetic that he was committed to and, uh, you know, allowed for uh, uh, sort of like uh, the <clears throat> production, the making of images that they combine the somber, the lyrical, uh, and the, the melancholic as well, in a more succinct way, as opposed to, you know, uh, kind of sitting in an island or in the, in the south of Greece. Uh, so, uh, th but th this was a conscious choice and he uh, repeatedly emphasized that, yeah, he liked shooting there in these places in the north, uh, uh, because, uh, he definitely wanted to avoid the stereotypical image of the country as a place of leisure for uh, people from the core, <laughs> technically. And, uh, you know, the, 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 there is obviously uh, a fear of tourism that kind of you can see in other countries also from um, peripheral economies as a, a, an imperialist form of uh, um, intervention into the economy because tourism uh, kind of, uh, uh, in a way, the, the, the way the tourist industry is now in Europe, uh, it's pretty much uh, sort of like um, creates a division of labor uh, where certain states can do this and that and other states can do something else, where certain states can be producers and certain, uh, certain states can be leisure providers. Uh, but, uh, using predominantly materials uh, produced in the core nations. So, um, yeah, obviously, uh, I, I guess uh, that in Angelopoulos, there is a, an unconscious, perhaps, desire to fight this touristic, to, to debunk, to, to, yeah, to go beyond that touristic image of Greece and think about it uh, and produce images that, uh, yeah, they are much more complex and, uh, reveal something that uh, is unfamiliar about the country, but in the same way that he wants to reveal something that is unfamiliar to many about its history. Um, yeah, I think that this is dialectically interconnected about which parts of the country he focuses on also. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think it's clear from what you said and from watching Angelopoulos' films that he had a, a deep fondness for the village, the Greek village, uh, he, mm -hmm. he even said that he had been to all villages in mainland Greece. He made that claim. Uh, obviously, we don't know if it's real or not. But I, I mean, the meaning we can take from this is that he had a, a very deep fondness for it, for the, the Greece that is not seen in the postcards, the, the Greece mm -hmm. that yeah. has been in there for millennia, uh, that's got a, a very distinctive spirit. And at the same time, like we were talking before, he does not use this to make a, a patriotic claim concerning Greek culture. It's it's a claim that goes beyond that. It's about the power of the village, but on, on a worldly level, On uh, in a village that could, in this case, is in Greece, but it could have been in Portugal, for example. It could have been on a different country. It's the power of that of the community, of uh, living together, of understanding how people can coexist and understand one another and that's that's very beautiful as well i feel like there's at the same time there's a, another aspect that often comes across in his films which is the interpretation of borders and frontiers we often see yeah. in these films because of the travelings we were just talking about we see people going across borders being stopped at checkpoints being jailed up or being exactly. interrogated uh, I, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about uh how Angelopoulos uh, frames the question of borders, their their meaning and their understanding. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the, there is a one uh, particular trilogy of films, which is called the trilogy of, uh, of borders. I think the, the trilogy of silence is uh, uh, Voyage to Kithira, uh, Landscape in the Mist, and then uh, uh, the, uh, the Suspended Step of the Stork. Uh, and then we have, uh, if I'm correct, yeah, this is the trilogy of silence. Uh, no, no, no. The trilogy of silence is the Voyage to, to Kithira, the Beekeeper, mm -hmm. and Landscape in the Mist. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, the suspended step of the stork. The trilogy of borders, yeah. yeah. Which is the suspended step of the stork, Ulysses Gaze, and Eternity uh, and a Day. Eternity and a Day, exactly. So uh, it, it, over in, in these films, the emphasis is more on kind of uh, contemporary history, the after effects of contemporary history, thinking about migration and economic and political migration. But interestingly, this is also interconnected with uh, what I said before, the lack of a collective dream. Uh, I don't know if you remember the suspended step of the story, the disappearing politician played by Marcelo Mastroianni, mm -hmm. talks about how in the wake of the new century, what, what we need is a collective dream uh, that is uh, obviously lacking. And, uh, and yeah, borders, uh, I mean, uh, again, I would say that these films so kind of Angelopoulos' internationalism again, in the sense that he kind of, he's puzzled by borders, he's puzzled by their existence, he's, pu their existence. he's puzzled by how um, someone is allowed uh, or not allowed to go somewhere and to move, whereas someone else is allowed to go everywhere. How, uh, who, who delineates these borders and what makes people move, for what reasons and why, and, uh, you know, as I said, like in the very beginning, I think, of this conversation, these are very pertinent questions that uh, we ask nowadays also, like when it comes to thinking about what in Europe we call the refugee crisis. And, I mean, uh, thinking about how European core countries sell, make extraordinary money by selling certain countries like uh, weapons and arms. And, uh, you know, when the after effects of these policies uh, face these core countries with the European and uh, uh, with the flows of migrants, they really don't want to acknowledge the structural role they played in this. And I think that Angelopoulos films do not preach, but they point a lot to these things. They point to certain sure that there's a, a causal link. For example, in, in the example that you just said, obviously there's a causal link when you sell weapons to another country, there's going to be death and destruction, people are going to flee, and they're probably going to come to a place where there's peace or there's no no war going on. Uh, and <laughs> it's interesting that they do not seem to understand that there's a, an obvious causal link. But sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, 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 it's a dialogue. And, and definitely, exactly. Yeah, like this is a very good example. Like, I mean, we might want to think about something like the civil war in Congo, how this civil war uh, started precisely for the precious metals there and uh, minerals that they allow for the production of computers, mobile phones, etc., etc., that they are heavily consumed in core and even peripheral economies. So, I mean, thinking about these things is important to sort of like de-Europeanize the problem of migration because, uh, you know, Europe calling it the my refugee crisis is very problematic uh, because it's not a refugee crisis, it's a crisis of the global system, uh, if, if you think about it. And uh, I, I guess that Angelopoulos' films, uh, be, uh, these are like, for me, the most successful in this respect is the uh, suspended step of the stork. Uh, they point to these things, they point on, they, they ask the right questions, like, you know, at some point, what makes people move? What are the reasons and how, uh, what are the new realities that this kind of flow, that these flows uh, that they try to be suppressed by obviously the European countries will lead to? And uh, so, yeah, uh, he's uh, definitely not somebody who, uh, who believes in borders. His characters, 
uh, are exiles, are people who are exiled in their own country at some point. It's like, you know, in Vagyas to Kithira, the communist who returns back to Greece and is, doesn't belong anywhere. He faces a consumerist 98 is Greece, who is uh, totally removed from his own uh, image. Uh, the same with um, the, uh, the, the politician played by Marcelo Mastroianni, who is an exile in his own country, who uh, ends up uh, disappearing uh, just to, uh, to because he, he, he cannot uh, adjust himself to the new historical reality, where there is no kind of utopia in it. The same with Harvey Keitel, Play, the, the character played by Harvey Keitel is an exile in the United States of America. He's also an exile in Greece. Whenever he comes back to, uh, he faces demonstrations, and this is a kind of a self-reflexive uh, thing for Angelopoulos. He faces people demonstrating against his own films, and uh, he goes to the Balkans to to find a new cinematic language rooted in the past. So yeah, his characters are all exiles, exiles living either in their own country or exiles. Um, unwilling exiles and uh, the same happens like if you think about it with in his early films like in uh, the reconstruction where the economic migrant returns back home facing you know like his family after many many years which is a very current pattern with the gastarbeiters in, in germany greek gastarbeiters and uh, the same with uh, the traveling players who are not rooted anywhere they're constantly moving and uh, so yeah he's his characters are exiles, and um, Angelopoulos was an exile in his own country, in the sense that he was somebody who was misunderstood, um, because obviously as an underdeveloped country, Greece didn't experience modernism and didn't have that culture, um, and wasn't so familiar with it. So it was very difficult for him to be uh, acknowledged and understood in his own countries. So there is a, a, this sense of exile throughout his films and the critique of borders, uh, I would say, as um, sort of like, uh, not irrational, but as arbitrary uh, ways of mm, sort of like uh, uh, allowing someone, uh, measuring where, where can somebody stay and where he's not or she is not allowed to stay. So, yeah. Your answer definitely reassures me uh, a bit because I was under the impression that that was the meaning in many of his films when he questioned the legitimacy of, of borders. I felt like he was actually kind of undermining the legitimacy of borders in the sense that there's a, an element of randomness related to it. And, you know, it provokes as he makes this question, uh, like you said, uh, when we witness somebody being stopped at a, at a checkpoint, uh, children, for example, they cannot go through, or if they go through, they are in peril because they'll be chased by the guards, or it forces you to ask, why are people uh, fleeing? Why are people being stopped at the borders? Why people cannot escape from a, a, a war and seek a peaceful country to have a, a better future? It, you know, it forces to to keep questioning these assumptions that we have that most films actually do not make they, they do not make these questions most films would take advantage of a, a situation of war to present a love story to present a war film to present a, a suspense or a espionage kind of film and Angelopoulos does none of that he wants us to go further he wants us to ponder on why that is actually happening not what kind of story you can develop amidst that setting but why is that setting even real why it's even happening so i think that's one of the things what that he makes his work so so important so thank you for your answer that definitely clarified my interpretation of it i also wanted to ask you given that angelopoulos uh, is like you said a, a left-leaning filmmaker with uh, very distinctive ideals and principles given your understanding your knowledge of greek history would you say that his depiction of the greek history is faithful in his films I mean, just to start with, like, when I was talking about Angelopoulos, I'm talking uh, not about the man per se, because I don't know much about the man, and I try not to have a very terrorist reading of the work. I'm talking about the work as a body of work. So for yes, me, Angelopoulos yes. are the films. Like, exactly. uh, so I cannot mean about the person. Uh, as a person, I'm talking about the aesthetic, the political, the aesthetic tropes, the political questions, the 
the consistency uh, that uh, characterizes uh, his whole body of work. Uh, uh, for now, to, to answer the question about Greece, um, faithful, uh, you know, uh, there is that saying about Nietzsche that uh, but by Nietzsche that there are no facts and interpretations. <laughs> but I would say, though, is that there is, um, in his films, which are about history, there is a dialectical aspect that he presents both sides and obviously, um, uh, dialectics doesn't mean uh, uh, total objectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, he allows uh, sort of like for uh, the negative aspects of the Greek bourgeoisie and the sort of like uh, of the Greek upper class and the way it has looked at the country since um, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, you could say, and even since independence in the 19th century. Uh, to emerge, so he allows this to emerge, and uh, uh, certainly the, uh, there is also a, a critique of the left because of the dialectics in it. For instance, in Megalexados, we see how a great experiment in uh, sort of like a communal, uh, a, a, a great, a, a great communist early proto-communist commune turns into a dictatorship which uh, is um, uh, a narrative about uh, international communism, you could say, rather than just Greece, because, you know, uh, we never had like a, a communist takeover of power. I mean, apart from uh, the years of the resistance where uh, the partisans had their own independent state. Uh, so there is certainly, I wouldn't say objective image, but there is certainly a dialectical. So uh, he allows the contradictions to emerge uh, throughout his films. For instance, like uh, um, we see in the traveling place when the, the official Communist Party asks the partisans to, do, to surrender their arms. And obviously the scene is framed in a way that is very critical of this choice. And um, so, yeah, he, he has like, I would say in his best films, a more clinical gaze uh, that uh, is uh, the product of his engagement with cinema verite and the work of Jean Roux also while he was in France and he got to learn much about that. And uh, yeah, this kind of clinical gauge is beyond good and evil. You could say it allows uh, things to emerge uh, in a non over dramatic way, if I'm, I could say, but also, like if you see films like The Hunters, where you see how people who uh, got tired of living um, under the boot of the military and the police and the upper class ended up also uh, reconciling themselves with the situation, former communists becoming part of the of the upper class itself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he certainly tries to to paint a more contradictory image. Uh, rather than the black and white of history. I see. The reason why I asked this question is because, to me at least, I never felt like I was being proselytized. I never felt a tinge of propaganda in these films, like one would feel when watching an Eisenstein film, for example. I, I felt like the way that he presented the occurrences in his films, to me, it felt like it gave space and time to those contradictions, like you said, to arise for a person to to understand the context of the situation without being told with a with a specific point in mind. I never felt like his film had a propagandistic tone to it. I, I only asked the question just because obviously knowing that Angelopoulos had a, a certain political leaning, somebody else could eventually ask if those films had merit because of that. But for me, his films are important in the sense that allow us to make those understandings and those distinctions. Obviously, my understanding of Greek history is very superficial. I know a few things. Actually, a lot of it I've learned from Angelopoulos himself, from the films he did. So I was just interested in seeing a, an opinion from someone that's from an actual Greek person. But other than that, continuing, uh, I was wondering, since you've written about uh, the influence of Kafka and Brecht in, in film, um, I was curious if you ever felt that Angelopoulos had influence from these two authors 
in these films? Do you find any influence in the films of Angelopoulos from Kafka and, and Brecht? I mean, Kafka, I wouldn't say so, but uh, Brecht, obviously, like, you know, I'm not the first one to point that out. He has admitted that himself, and like, there has been a lot of this, and uh, I've also written on this. Uh, certainly, like, in his uh, historical tetralogy, there is this sense of the tableau, and um, I pointed that earlier when I talked about this scene with uh, uh, the two people where they talk about international socialism and they start singing Carmela. So there is a sense that um, like Brecht, his films are a collection of independent tableau rather than a linear narrative. And um, Roland Barthes has written a bit about that, about how uh, Brecht's uh, theatre is structured around uh, a series of independent tableau. Uh, that they have a kind of a dialectical connection with each other rather than a linear. And certainly the traveling players, uh, the hunters, uh, uh, Mega Alexandros, but also Days of 36 uh, have that very strongly. Even some of his later films, which are more lyrical, uh, but uh, I would say that Ulysses Gay certainly, yes, uh, has a lot of that too. Uh, but also in terms of Brecht, like there is the portrayal of history from below, from the people rather than from great figures. Um, and uh, the, uh, the dialectical view of history in the sense that what we said before, like you know, about how it's not about uh, framing things in a dramatic way of good and bad, uh, but in uh, presenting the dialectical contradictions that allow you to take a stance of how you, you think. Uh, and certainly there are other things, like in his first uh, period, Angelopoulos didn't use extra diegetic music, and like Brecht, and there was like instead a separation of elements, a Brechtian separation of elements, where when the musical sequences happened, they were diegetic ones, and they function as a political commentary. You might remember the sequence in the traveling players, the dancing sequence, where uh, there is a kind of a, uh, a visible conflict between the students who are left-leaning students and the mm -hmm. kind of uh, the, the thugs from uh, the, the right who are armed. And uh, so, yeah, like uh, there is this Brechtian separation of elements in, in his first films. Uh, and uh, there is also a kind of a use of the Brechtian historisierum, as he calls it, which is a historicization, where different historical periods might be juxtaposed within a tableau to show us um, sort of like the historical continuity here in terms of the, the upper classes, uh, sort of like a role in the underdevelopment of Greece and its um, sort of like subjugation to the imperial sort of like policies of uh, other superpowers uh, and its subordination to them. So certainly, yeah, like uh, there is a big Brechtian kind of uh, influence that, uh, you know, some of that stuff are things that Janzo started first, like, you know, Miklos Janzo and uh, Angelopoulos develops them a bit further. But there are also, as I said before, like, you know, standard uh, modernist tropes, uh, uh, this kind of juxtaposition of many sequences. Um, I, I remember of a film by Andras Kovacs called Cold Days, typical modernist film. Or, you know, Alain René obviously did that in a different way in many of his films. and. Angelopoulos worked for a while, I think, as a Renee's assistant. So uh, these are things that, you know, you can see how uh, <clears throat> certain modern stylistic elements were not only international, but everybody was sort of like uh, learning from someone else and copying and pasting from someone else. Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily uh, uh, signature or terrorist things. They are part of a broader, wider tradition. I see. That's interesting because one of the most compelling aspects of uh, Angelopoulos' films was what you just mentioned, the historical juxtaposition uh, of scenes. I remember one of the scenes in The Traveling Players, uh, we have this group of people at the pier watching a, a boat going to the distance, a, a typical Angelopoulos shot actually uh, at sunset, and then they move away and there's a car that you see that goes along the train tracks Mm -hmm. and disappears outside the frame and then suddenly a car from uh, 20 or 30 years before comes back again and there's this temporal leap 
within this continuity in the sequence shot. And I thought it was amazing. And obviously he uses this a lot in in his other films. Uh, that scene specifically struck me because it was one of the first instances of that kind of scene that I have seen back then. It was a long time ago. Uh, but it's interesting to know that this is not a novelty by Angelopoulos. It had been used. It, it comes from a tradition of experimentation and of modernism in cinema. I'm glad that you mentioned yeah. it. And uh, now, uh, as I am, as you are talking, I was trying to find uh, the title of a film uh, because, yeah, which I've seen uh, repeatedly the last few years by Istvan Zabo, a Hungarian new wave filmmaker, and I, I highly recommend it. It's called 25 Fireman Street. And uh, it has lots of that stuff also. This film was made in 1973, uh, a year before uh, Angelopoulos is uh, sort of like uh, uh, the traveling place. And it is a, a film about the post-war history uh, as it is imagined, remembered uh, through nightmares, through the past, the present uh, of the inhabitants of a house in the center of Budapest. And if you see that film, like the boundaries between the past, the present and the future are so complicated in some sequences. And uh, yeah, well, you can see the more you dig into films like from the canon of modernism, uh, you see that, yeah, many of the things that we consider as signature style are very much rooted in a tradition, as I said before, and not... Uh, so yeah, like this is a, when I first saw that film, I was, uh, you know, stunned. And I, I, my, my friend's response, and maybe he didn't, I said, Angelopoulos must have seen this film when, before starting making his own uh, films. And uh, yeah, it's a, a, a exemplary of uh, this kind of uh, repeatability and the working of modernist themes by filmmakers in the 20th century. Uh, I mean, in one of the things we we, start, we noted in our book on Angelopoulos in the introduction was, uh, I don't know if you've read it, but it says Angelopoulos in the lingua franca of modernism. So this was what we really tried to do a lot in the book um, and most contributors did was to place him within a broader cinematic tradition rather than treat him as a maverick. And this is what happens with many Greek studies on the filmmaker, uh, where they treat him as a maverick, because obviously they compare him to the Greek film industry. But if you try to place any filmmaker within a tradition, you see that you know they are not a maverick, they're just continuing a certain cinematic tradition. Then this applies to Chinese filmmakers of the present, for instance, Jia Zhangge, who repeatedly said that he wants to do something like what Antonioni did in Italy. He wants to do something similar in China. And his influences are, you know, sort of like very much grounded in cinematic modernism. And, you know, it, it is important to, I think we do more justice to filmmakers if we place them in a, within a tradition rather than by saying that these are exceptions to the rule. And because by doing so, uh, we actually saw uh, the fascination for the medium and for cinema itself. Like, I mean, Angelopoulos, many of these musical sequences in Angelopoulos' films, like where there is no extra diegetic music, or it's only diegetic, are very much um, rooted in musicals, for instance. He said he was a big fan of musicals. I remember very reading cool. in an interview. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I mean, it's it's important to, and again, this is a practice of cinematic modernism, really working of popular forms in a different way. And, you know, you, we mentioned Brecht before, I think uh, Brecht was a fan of cabaret and uh, the opera, but he totally reworked them to, to use these sequences as political commentary. So, yeah, I do think we do more justice when we try to place them within a kind of a, a tradition rather than think of them as the geniuses and all this kind of uh, uh, cliche approach of the creative genius and whatever, you know. I agree with you. I mean, we can only benefit from having these artists contextualized into their tradition, into their, uh, into their history and the experiences, their relationships with other kinds of filmmaking and other authors. Uh, I think we as viewers can only benefit from it. So it's definitely important to do that. I had a, a couple of questions more. Uh, one of them is just about 
the fact that Angelopoulos, even though he's getting a bit more recognition as time goes by, I still feel like there's plenty of his films that didn't have a, an HD transfer yet. You don't get to see too many Blu-ray versions of his films, uh, whereas you would find of other similar filmmakers from the same period. In other words, why are the films of Angelopoulos not being given, for example, high resolution transfers? Uh, why are they not being published in Blu-ray versions uh, as of yet? I know you can find a few, but uh, it's been very slow. I don't think I'm the right person to answer that because I don't know much about the industrial aspect of things. I know that, you know, there is a very niche market about Angelopoulos. And I know that uh, some of the first DVDs were sort of like um, DVD collections were in Asia. Actually, my, the first time I received, I got the DVD collection was an Asian uh, copy and not pirated, proper one, um, because I... There was no criterion or the other one, what's the name of them? Artificial Eye? Artificial Eye, yeah. uh, as yet in 2004, Re later, uh, you could access those. So I, I really cannot tell you about that. And I, I, I imagine that it's a very niche market and also uh, he wanted to have a big uh, input uh, on the transfer from film to DVD. Uh, so. I don't think that plays a role in it, but uh, his family that has the rights now mm, has to do that. So I'm really not very mm. uh, aware of this politics. But like, uh, oh, oh, certainly the fact that some of his films are in DVD, at least, not necessarily Blu-ray, helped uh, him gain a bit of, uh, uh, helped uh, like, you know, some retrospectives to happen in places across the world, including Australia, America, the United States of America, and Asia and South America, so even in Europe, obviously. So it helped uh, people get acquainted with his work a bit. Yeah, hopefully that will develop the interest in doing those those transfers in working uh, in order to achieve that. Um, I have one last, last question for you, which is, do you know of any filmmakers currently working that you feel like they're continuing the work of Angelopoulos that you would say are carrying the torch that was being carried by Angelopoulos while he was alive? Have you come across films where you feel like his uh, style or themes, the subjects are being taken on and further developed? Have you come across films where you felt that? I mean, you mean Greek filmmakers or in general? Both, either in Greece or, or abroad? I mean, to be honest, as I said, like, I I don't think of a filmmaker creating a school so much. Uh, but there are filmmakers whose work uh, kind of made me identify parallels. For instance, uh, this Arabian Nights by Gomez uh, was a film that I thought that, wow, like, uh, similarly epic, the, the dramatized style and... Uh, uh, political as well, but dialectical at the same time and focusing on history from below rather than history from the top. Uh, so, yeah, this, this was a film that I said, yeah, this, uh, this is uh, like early Angelopoulos in a way. And obviously, you know, when uh, Gia Junk, is, though it was made in 2004, very early, is still live, is another example of a filmmaker who, you know, who you can say, yeah, like, this follows the same tradition, not Angelopoulos, but the same cinematic modernist tradition. Where it takes a, an individual na drama where placed in a specific location, a specific historical period, but this history is not a backdrop, a dramatic backdrop, as you said before, for something to happen and stuff. This actually affects the drama uh, so history is the major protagonist that affects a lot of the drama that we see on screen. So yeah, this was Still Life by Jia Zanke, was and many of his other films. Or Diao uh, Yinan, uh, another Chinese filmmaker, he recently did a film which was actually in uh, uh, Wuhan uh, about the Wild Goose Lake or something. But some of his previous films, like Night Train and uh, 
the uniform where a, an individual story of alienation allows many other things to emerge, structural, social and political and historical. So yeah, these are some filmmakers that say yes, obviously. I wouldn't say Bellatar, for example, not because Bellatar was making films at the time that Angelopoulos was making. And Bellatar comes also from a cinematic tradition <laughs> that is so rich. So it would be a sacrilege to say that he follows Angelopoulos' example. Bellatar had Janso to draw, had, I don't know, like uh, Isvan Sabo that I said, many, many other, Andras, Andras Kovac, many, many filmmakers of uh, from his own uh, country. So, you know, uh, but he belongs to the same cinematic tradition also as Angelopoulos, obviously. And uh, I do think that some of um, his uh, best films, like uh, Berg, Bergmeister Harmonies, could be compared to early Angelopoulos, but not in the sense that he has copied him or anything, or because, um, yeah, uh, as I said, uh, Tar has come from a very rich cinematic country. Uh, so, yeah. Very well. Um, thank you very much for that. That was a very enlightening, very informative and dynamic conversation. I'm so happy to have been able to chat about Angelopoulos with Likewise. you. Um, Angelos, I'm going to put on the video description as well the links for your works for the viewers that are interested in reading your books. Um, it's been a pleasure. So thank you very much for that. And hopefully I'll see you another time. Thank you very much.